welcome to District SF, featuring District 8. District 8 is well known as one of the city's most beautiful and desirable areas. The heart of the district is the Castro Street area, but there is much more to this district. The district includes the Mission Dolores area, the DeBose Triangle, Corona Heights, Buena Vista Heights, Upper Market, Eureka Valley, Noe Valley, Twin Peaks, Diamond Heights, Glen Park, and the San Jose and Guerrero area. Because it's such a large and diverse area, we can only scratch the surface in our half-hour program, but we will introduce you to many of the beautiful attractions, vexing issues, and unique plans for the future that make District 8 a special place to live, work, and visit. I view District 8 in at some sense as being kind of a little like Mayberry. Uh, in the Castro, it's a little like Gayberry, but all of our neighborhoods are really tightly woven. There's a lot of connection of people. There's a great deal of awareness of what's going on in the world, in the state, and here locally. There are just so many things about it that I enjoy. It's beautiful, it's got great views. Of the three places I've lived, two of them have had spectacular vistas of San Francisco, which I think many of us appreciate, and it's probably why there's so many land use fights when people don't want their views interrupted. Initially, when I came here, it felt very warm and friendly and welcoming to all kinds of people. It's close to transportation. It's not just the Castro. Truth be told, we're probably 40% of the district, so most of the district is not the Castro. The neighborhood goes all the way up into the hills, fancy houses in the hills, all the way down to Dolores Park and the Mission. Noe Valley is where a lot of uh, the kids and families are, so there's a big focus on the parks in the area, the big focus is on the school, and so a lot of attention is paid to the schools, whether it's uh, uh, James Lick Middle School or Alvarado School, there's a lot of uh, attention that's focused on it. Then you go to Glen Park, which is really kind of a village. It's this, uh, it's this duality where we have one of our major transit destinations in the Glen Park BART station and a lot of connectivity about traffic and trucks and a lot of uh, attention at, at to how you keep the feel of the village and recognize that we have to mitigate buses, park and ride, and traffic going through the area. Even though the Castro represents less than half of the voters in District 8, I think everyone agree it's the hotbed of political activity in this district. So uh, that's exciting. I like to walk, and I like to take public transportation, and I like to bicycle, and I also drive. Those things aren't all really possible, especially in some of the San Francisco, San Francisco suburbs. I loved the economic diversity. I loved all the dog parks. We live about two blocks away from about three different parks, and that was really great, and I loved it. And, and just the diversity of restaurants and stores and shops, cute little neighborhood places. It's a great place to live and, and have a business, uh, the Castro, because we're a destination. And when you go to market a commercial area, that's something that a lot of other commercial areas have to, to work at to create their own identity. We're extremely lucky in, in the Castro Upper Market because we have a built-in identity. I mean, you see the rainbow flag, you see the rainbow banners up and down Market Street. That's a tourist draw, especially the gay tourist. It's one of the few neighborhoods that remains affordable in the city. There are a lot of families with young children in this neighborhood because the less than ideal urban planning has resulted in less safe places, but still a nice older housing stock that you can have families in. It's not Noe Valley, and it's not really the mission either. It's really kind of in limbo. The second factor I would say is the diversity of people. There are a lot of really terrific people that live here that are open to all sorts of possibilities. I lived in Portland before this, which I liked for a lot of the other urban reasons that, you know, it's a bikeable city and walkable city, but it's also one of the whitest cities I've ever seen in my whole life, and it really freaked me out. Um, so, you know, growing up in Chicago, New York, I've, you know, I've had sushi and Chinese food and, you know, every cuisine my entire life. Um, so, you know, I just like different kinds of people and you know if I don't have somebody disagree with me at least once every five minutes something is wrong <laughs> and this neighborhood is like that. The one problem I've never had to face in being supervisor of District 8 is apathy. I've never had a day that people haven't cared enough to email me or call me or tell me something's wrong or I want to do something different or I want to do something new. We are extremely lucky in the Castro because the Residents Association, EVPA, the Merchants Association, now the CBD, we all work together effectively. 
and we have a supervisor who is committed to working together with us to, to accomplish very concrete goals. And uh, so we're very lucky. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an exciting place to live. The beauty and convenience offered by District 8's neighborhoods has made the area a highly desirable and expensive place to live. How can these neighborhoods maintain their famous diversity when sky-high housing prices are driving so many people out of the district? To me, housing really is the, the issue of, of our time. There is less, far less diversity now in the city than there was 10 years ago. I think the one area that is dif uh, difficult for younger people moving in, and that is the lifeblood of any community is the infusion of younger people, inclus inclusiveness of a younger people. Um, it is difficult because uh, prices are high for real estate and rents are high. Young people who were at risk, not accepted at their homes in the Midwest or other parts, thrown out from their families were coming here. And the challenge was not only was this an expensive and difficult city to gain a foothold in, but generally within the first week or so, a young adult would be offered methamphetamine. There's a debate now about, certainly in the Castro, um, should the Castro continue to be a uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender friend, friendly neighborhood. Well, of course, should it be a, a neighborhood that really is seen as, uh, as it's been called, the gay ghetto, um, as more and more people are moving in who are uh, heterosexual and more and more people who uh, have kids and are heterosexual. To me, that's not so much the debate. The debate is really about economics, because what, what's happening is people are moving in who have money uh, and can afford to buy in District 8 and pushing out other people who can no longer live here. The average house costs a million dollars. Now, there's good in that and there's bad in that. When the city was going through a huge recession as a result of the dot-com, the value of real estate and the fact that it kept turning over really kind of kept our economy. It was one of the legs that kept us standing up. The debate is really how do we, how do we create a city that really is for all of us, that's not for sale, um, and that encourages people to, to live here because they care about the community and they want to engage in community life, not just because they can afford to live here. One of the unfortunate things I see with people moving into the city buying million or multi-million dollar housing is that there's a sense that once you get your house, what you care about is protecting your house and your little piece of the pie. Um, I see less and less commitment to the community. Is there a phenomenon where people are fairly trapped in their houses, where they have to stay in that house because if they sell, they're not going to be able to find something comparable or better? Uh, I think that part of the city's responsibility is to uh, look at that in the upper market process where I'm trying to look at the mix of housing. I'm also putting a measure on the ballot for this June, which is to create incentives to build more family uh, affordable housing units, which basically would allow you within the envelope to possibly increase the density a bit. If you take your studios and one bedrooms that are going to be below market rate and make those uh, uh, two bedrooms and three bedrooms that are going to be more suitable for, for families. Our urban design plan seems really ready to be thrown out on its head and the views that we love from District 8 as you look down across the city into the bay are already being blocked and as you come into the city uh, the effect is going to be a, a walled part of the city that you're not going to be able to see the hills driving into into the city. Our district was hit hard by uh, Ellis Act evictions. It was a tool that the state allows and it did displace people and it's something that I hope that we can continue to try and address. Very smart people have been talking about this for a very long time and I think some really good plans had been developed uh, that that our plans where we work with developers. We work with developers to get them to build more affordable housing. We uh, hope for more incentives. We hope for more contribution to uh, city services in the building of the housing. There is the Mission Safeway, which is currently a single story building that is surrounded by a very substantial parking lot. And there are several other parcels like that. So a lot of people in the neighborhood have been talking about, you know, building those spaces out and, and putting all of the parking underground.